<laughs> it's a pleasure to introduce Ron. Uh, so uh, he, uh, okay, everybody knows him, and he probably brought these two people here in the uh, in uh, University of South Carolina. So, and he will talk about the optimality of algorithms for approximation and computation. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. So I want to start with a first a few remarks about uh, the birthday boy. Unfortunately, the images are not as sharp here on the uh, on the screen. Let me just see. Here. Yeah, but the, the screen is PTA. <laughs> though, right? I, had, I had the same problem <laughs> on these. I'm trying to remember where my uh, pointer is. Where's the pointer? That's not it. Oh! <laughs> Your favorite guy is the, You know, he, he came to town today to meet you guys. So I warn you have to go over to Benedict College. He's waiting for you with a bottle of champagne. And he says uh, that uh, we have the very best mathematicians in the world here in the U United States. <laughs> And uh, they say, I'm a math genius. <laughs> yes. This is Donald talking, not me. <laughs> and he, probably they're right. <laughs> see, see you later in, in Columbia. So the Donald says, congratulations. <laughs> so I first want to say a little bit about uh, Penshaw. Maybe Bobby can help fill in because... Uh, Vasil used to visit here a lot. And of course, I heard about Penshaw from Vasil. And, and Penshaw, it was almost all good things about you, you know. Uh, but I hadn't met you. But then uh, there was a conference in Bulgaria, and I can't remember whether it was in Sofia or in Varna, where we first met. Was it Varna? Yeah. Yeah, so we first. Bobby was there, I guess. Yeah. Bobby was there, but I don't think Colin was there. And uh, I took this picture. This is a picture from actually from Ober Volfar. Uh, this is Ed Saf, Volodia, Penshaw, Bore, Kashin, and you can't see Dietrich Bress there, but he's a guy in dark. On my computer, you could see it. Now, why I took this particular picture? Because you see how Penshaw looks here with these sunglasses and everything. Well, the first time we met him, we were in uh, Varna, and uh, he looked like a mafia guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark car. Yeah, yeah, and we went to a restaurant. Huh? On top of it, he always used to have this white suit. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think. Yeah. I mean, that's what Mark said when he saw him in Paris first. Are you working with the mafia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so we went to a restaurant there in Varna. I don't know what restaurant. Were you at the, the restaurant when we no. met? Maybe. No. But there was a lot of pencil boys there at the table, and we were drinking and everything. And usually when you're with pencil and you start drinking, there comes a critical time <laughs> in the drinking, whether you're going to go to the next level or not. And the next level always involves singing. You know, <laughs> and <clears throat> when we had our parties at my house, it was always P Ranush or Ramse or what is something P. You know, drink, drink, and we'd be in a big circle, and everybody had to drink and pass the drink around, and everybody got plastered. <laughs> so here, this this also occurred. We began singing. So I, uh, you know, it was my turn to sing, and I sang this fight song from the University of Michigan, <coughs> uh, football song. And it was like, hail to the victors, valiant, hail to, you know. I went through this song, and this prompted Penshaw to get up. And Penshaw sang some Bulgarian Fighting song. I'm fighting song, right? Do you remember the song? <laughs> Can you sing it? <laughs> but in the middle of the song comes a whistle. He grabs
grabs his, remember this? Yeah, yeah. yeah he grabs his mouth and he makes this large uh, whistle. Uh, so this was my first uh, impression of pencil. <laughs> and uh, of course you start to learn a lot about pencil. He also likes to use the, the word boom all the time. You know, yeah. he's doing mathematics and boom. You know, and you wonder, what? wait a minute, what is this guy, a terrorist or something, mafia, boom? <laughs> so, became a little worried, but uh, eventually we figured, no, no, it's okay. So we worked very hard to, to hire Penshaw here at uh, South Carolina, and he came here. And uh, this part isn't working. But uh, he was a great hire for USC, and as people who have worked with him know, he's very deep, can solve very difficult problems, and he also is in, uh, has some famous quotes that get associated with him. <laughs> One of them is, I can do every, anything, but I can't do everything, <laughs> at all, finite amount of time. <clears throat> Another one is I can find a mistake in every paper, right, Pencil? <laughs> now, does that include your papers or not? <laughs> huh? Your papers as well. Yeah, but also your papers. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the infamous boom that I already mentioned. So, you know, it's like that cartoon that you sometimes see where uh, these guys are working in some complicated mathematics. Mm. And then at the bottom, a guy says, so in this cartoon, it says, and a miracle occurs here. And some guy on the bottom says, could you explain that step to me, please, you know, where the miracle occurs? Well, uh, with Penshaw, it's uh, sort of the same, the, the same sort of thing. He uh, has these slang words to explain how suddenly everything gets solved, <laughs> which some people can understand and others cannot. But uh, yeah, this is from a seminar we had. We used to have a seminar over in Sumwalt, not Sumwalt, uh, Lacan, third floor of Lacan. Yeah. Maybe some, did you ever speak there, Albert? Yeah. yeah. This is one of the seminars. So this is me, this is Volodya, that's Penshaw, and that's Peter Oswald. Okay. Okay, so now what, had, what was bad after we hired Penshaw? Bad for Penshaw <laughs> is that uh, we introduced him to the Gamecock sports. So at first he was very enthusiastic, you know, like sports, go to the games and everything. We go and we tailgate at Cox Corner. And before the game, you know, a few drinks, and we're going to kill them. We're going to, you know, no mercy, no, no, take no prisoners, blah, 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 you know, on and on. And then after the game, he would walk back, you know, <laughs> like that, and said, oh, my God, what, what happened? <laughs> so this is the curse of being a Gamecock fan, right? Are you still a Gamecock fan, or you gave up uh, by now? <laughs> what a miserable life, huh? Okay, now a few words about Wolfgang. Well, you know, Wolfgang, he had his 60th, 65th, I don't remember all the celebrations. Your retirement party. So I've had the opportunity of uh, saying words about Wolfgang many times. Some of this is a repeat. The first time I met <coughs> Wolfgang was at a conference in Oberwolfach. And uh, what was interesting was uh, maybe the first time I was to Germany was in the early 70s. What year was that? 74. 74. So what I remember is you take the train and, you know, in those days this was, by the way, be, when they had the old institute, so it still had the uh, old structure, hadn't been demolished yet, and they hadn't built the new library and the new seminar room and so on. Many of you probably don't know that, that structure, but I was picked up in a town that was either Hausach or Hausach. I mean, there are two towns whose name is very similar by uh, 
Eberhard Stark. Yeah. Right, so yeah, yeah. May he rest in peace. Eberhard was a great guy. He came and it was like 85 degrees in the summer in the Black Forest, and he came and he put on his some gloves. I go, what the hell? I mean, it's warm outside. Why, why are you putting on these gloves? You get in the car and then you understood why you're <laughs> going through the, the mountains. Anyway, we end up, this is a picture, this isn't a, a, a real picture taken together, this is splicing together. The good looking guy on the right is me. <laughs> the other guy here is the way Wolfgang looked at that time. So you see the difference now between, not that much difference, but some. Oh, much. <laughs> and uh, when we, when I went to the conference and I saw Wolfgang around there, you know, they have these workers that come from the, the village and prepare the meals, take care of the table. I thought Wolfgang was one of the boys or something. They were, they were <coughs> hiring him, giving him some money. The money. Yeah, clink guilt, right? Uh, but no, the next uh, day in, in the morning he gave this great talk on, on approximation methods and I suddenly realized here's an emerging mathematician of high caliber. So uh, I usually say something here about Wolfgang and Taekwondo because uh, when you know Wolfgang you find out that he was second in the world in Taekwondo in one year, which you'll tell me the year. 75. 75. So I usually tell the story, I don't want to repeat the whole story, but, you know, I got a letter from the other participant who was number one, and the story was that uh, there were only two participants in that weight class. That <laughs> uh, it was also the first time that they allowed women to participate with men in the same weight class. And that uh, she, she was glad that they let her participate because she was 60 years old. <laughs> and that she couldn't remember much about Wolfgang because all she could see was his backside as he was running away from her. <laughs> now I want to tell you this is not true. Okay, I want to publicly apologize. This was not true. She was only 59, both guys. <laughs> okay. All right, so Wolfgang has become a great friend of mine. We all know he's a great mathematician. Maybe you don't know as well that he's really a great man. He's very dedicated to family and friends. And he's somebody I can count on, and I really appreciate Wolfgang the years of friendship, and I look forward to many more. I hope we both last a long time. <clears throat> so we, we collaborated a lot. I say we've written about 35 papers. Now why do I say about 35? Because every time I count, I get a different answer. You know, this is the problem. When you get older, you know, and you have come to this point in the paper where you have to calculate something, and you calculate by hand, and you calculate seven times, and you get seven different answers. You know, what the hell is you know, going on? But anyway, about 35 uh, papers. And we cover a lot of topics, uh, some of them listed here. And many have been written with Albert, and it's unfortunate. This is a really nice picture of us from over Wolfhawk, but it doesn't uh, come out very well on the screen. And, of course, Albert is a great uh, collaborator and a great friend as well. And uh, you saw how, how wonderful he is at lecturing in the first talk. Okay, so we're actually, uh, if to, to explain a little bit our approach to mathematics. <coughs> when we meet, you know, we hear about a topic like... Uh, wavelets or compressed sensing or whatever we should you know, scratch our heads and try to figure out. And we always try to make a precise formulation. Okay, what, what are we really trying to do in this problem? Because a lot of times, you know, you read papers and you try to understand well, what, what the hell are, you know, what is the real problem that they're trying to solve? <clears throat> then we look for uh, a solution 
which we hope we can prove is optimal. That is, that nobody like Hong Wong is going to come along five years later and beat our algorithms or our, our theorems, right? So that's sort of our goal. <clears throat> We're actually writing a book on adaptivity, sparsity, and optimality in computation. Now, I wrote a book with a guy named called George Lorenz. And this book with Lorenz took 10 years. And I said, holy shit, 10 years? Are you kidding me? To write a book. This one is beating, already has <laughs> beaten the, the book of George with George Lorenz. So who knows when it will be done? Soon. Soon. <laughs> Within another 10 years, perhaps. Uh, so one of the things in this book we, we try to do is uh, describe optimality. What would be an optimal algorithm for the given task? And that's my segue into the talk. And that's what I want to talk about here. And it's something I've been thinking about for a lot of years. <clears throat> and I don't necessarily say that at this point I have the, the solution. But I want to talk about it. You can argue with me about it. We'll see. So, optimality in computation. And, you know, computation, numerical computation is a big area. You can be talking about numerical, linear algebra, whatever. Uh, I want to talk about problems where we have some underlying function and we want to numerically approximate this function. Maybe it's a solution to a PDE, that's what we know about the function parametric PDE, or maybe it's uh, to reconstruct a function from some measurements, like in compressed sensing. But I always have an underlying function that I'm trying to compute. So I'm not trying to compute the solution to a linear algebra problem, but an underlying function. And uh, we build algorithms to do this, and I want to it would be nice if I could say, well, this algorithm did the best that's really possible. There's a, I can prove that in general, no other algorithm can do better. So this is the form that I would like to formulate optimality in this, in this form, so to capture a function. Uh, and then after I discuss this, I'll say some words on deep learning and, and, and neural nets. So here's a setup of a, you know, this is sort of the underlying problem. We have a function. It's defined on some domain. I, just for convenience, make it 0, 1. High dimensional, typically. And I let it map into uh, some Bonnock space. You can think of it as the reals. Right? But if you remember Albert's talk, our function u of a, right, was mapping into a Banach space v. So a more general and useful formulation is to let it map into some Banach space. And then our, our task, our numerical da task, is to compute some approximation f hat to this underlying function f. Sometimes we have a little less of a numerical task where we have a quantity of interest we want to compute, mm -hmm. some mean behavior or, or something. I won't uh, get into that, but there is an analog of some of our theory for, for, for this case as well. <clears throat> so this setup of the problem covers a lot of numerical analysis, maybe half of it, at least, right? Half of numerical computations. Uh, numerical PDEs, quadrature learning, learning which is a big subject these days uh, with uh, the deep learning and all its hoopla around it. So that's the setting. So let's suppose I want to define what I mean by optimality in this setting. So first thing I have to do is we have to agree on how we're going to measure performance or error. If I come up with an algorithm, you do that we're, we're talking about the same thing. So we're interested in what's the error between what we compute and the true function f. 
and that error, I assume, is given by some norm on some Banach space. Maybe it's an LP norm, maybe it's a L infinity norm, whatever. You can choose the norm for now. And so our goal is to build an algorithm that approximates this underlying function f, and we measure the error in this norm. And of course, we're going to want the algorithms, I mean, we'll get into that. Okay. So if I want to make any quantitative statement about how well we can do, I need to know something about f. If I have no information about f, you can say nothing in spite of what you may want to continue to talk, you can't really come up with any error estimates or any comparison of different algorithms, right? You need some information about f. The information we, we have about f, we call this model class information. Uh, the usual model classes we use in analysis are Besov, Sobolev, uh, uh, band limited, things like that. Uh, in the case of PDEs, we're on pretty good grounds when we use those model classes because frequently for a PDE you can prove a regularity theorem that tells you that yes indeed F is in that model class if you assume about F. <laughs> In some areas, like in learning, it is not clear what is the model class. Real world images, I mean, they're doing classification in learning. What, what is the model class? They mean, real world, well, give me a precise definition. They don't. So you're always in a fighting mode because you don't even agree on what the objects you're trying to recover are, or what information you have about them. The next, and, and this is going to be the key of my talk, what are the admissible algorithms? <clears throat> what is an algorithm in this context? Now we have in mind, uh, you know, some root, uh, people in computer science probably have a definition of algorithm, a list of instructions and so forth and so on. And the co complexity of the algorithm may be the number of operations in, machine operations that are necessary to arrive at F hat. Some budget, you know, how much computation, how many minutes will it take you? So some number N that tells you how many arithmetic or comparisons or whatever you have. So that's sort of, <coughs> sort of the idea. There's another wrinkle that comes into numerical analysis that's important is in addition to the uh, fact that F is in this model class, that we need to have that information, <clears throat> there's a difference uh, in settings in terms of uh, what access do we have for, for about F. In some settings, in learning, you're given data. Well, then you don't know the full F, right? You're limited by the data. And that has to affect you, because you may be given lousy data, or you may be given good data, right? If I want to recover a function on 0, 1, and I give you only its point values on 0, a half, at some points on 0, a half, you're obviously not going to capture it well on 1, half, 1, right? So uh, that's uh, an issue, and I'm not going to talk too much about this issue. I could, but I don't, won't have enough time to, to talk about it, but I want to forewarn you that is an issue. In the case of PDEs, the information you have about F is that it solves the PDE, okay? But to utilize that information is not so straightforward. The fact that you know it's a solution to PDE doesn't tell you you really know F. I mean, you would have to do some work to extract information about F. Okay. So let me say a few words about model classes because that's an important ingredient. Uh, so uh, a model class is a compact set in X. Why a compact set? If, if it's not a compact set, I'm not going to be able to recover the elements to any accuracy, right? So X is the space in which I'm measuring error. And the functions F, the model class, which I'm calling K now, has to be a uh, compact subset of this uh, uh, 
space x. For example, if x is LP, you could take model classes that are smoothness spaces, like Sobolev or Besov uh, classes, but you know, we're sort of wedded to this from our history and, and analysis, but as we go into high dimensions and such, we see that, no, maybe this isn't the right type of model classes. In fact, in high dimensions, it's still not clear in high dimensions and probably is very problem dependent what the model classes should be. But you have ideas like sparsity, compressibility, anisotropy, tensor structures, and so on, uh, that pop up and that somehow people say, well, this is what I think the function has these properties, right? Okay, so, but for now, model class is simply a compact set in X. And X is the, the norm in which I measure error. So, now I come to what is really going to be probably the part of the talk you may or may not agree with and we could argue about. And then what are numerical algorithms? You know, if we want to say some algorithm is best, we have to somehow say what's in the competition? What are, what are the algorithms you're talking about? So the typical algorithm, if you want to approximate a function f hat, is you create some space, yn, your simpler space, at, that you're going to approximate f from the space yn. And I don't want to tie your hands and say what yn it should be. I don't, you know, it's up to you to decide what yn to use and to prove to me that that's a good choice of yn. If you're in deep learning, you say, oh, neural nets, that's, that's what it should be, you know. But uh, that, that's left open. <coughs> but uh, the history of this is such that you know, if you look back into the 1960s or 70s when we were doing things, all the YNs were linear spaces. You know, you had finite element spaces, you had polynomials, you had splines, you had that. They were all linear spaces of dimension N, some dimension. And N was sort of, you know, how complicated the space was. And uh, your, your comparison would be, okay, if, if you fix the dimension N, what's the best space to use in your given problem? Okay, later uh, we learned uh, that it's actually better to use nonlinear spaces. And we saw in Albert's talk, one of his things was his model class was actually a part of a nonlinear manifold, and he advocated that, that uh, using nonlinear methods of approximation should be more beneficial than linear. He, he did discuss linear in the beginning. Uh, but he advocated that nonlinear should be better than linear. So, even though we started in the 60s and 70s with linear algorithms, eventually we, we moved into numerical algorithms that had a nonlinear structure, such as adaptive algorithms, greedy algorithms, this, that, whatever your algorithm wants. Okay. <clears throat> Let me first say something, a few words about linear algorithms that will orient you a little bit, so where I'm going. Let's say that you 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 say, oh, no, look, uh, this nonlinear, I don't understand, I don't want to deal with it, I only want to talk about linear algorithms, so I'm going to use for my space yn, and remember yn is the space in which I create the f hat, right? f hat is going to be an element in yn, maybe it's a polynomial of degree n, trig polynomial, spline, span of radial basis functions, some finite dimensional wavelet space, uh, finite element space, whatever. If this is a linear space, and suppose you tie your hands and you say, okay, I'm only going to consider linear spaces to build my numerical algorithm. And then we have a pretty clear uh, description of the best you can do, right? Because there's this <clears throat> so an, an approximation to f, the be, if, once you specify the space y you were going to use, then the best you could do at approximating f would be this error. You would take the p that fit f the best, <clears throat> and that would give you an error. 
And so that's all you know about f is that it's in this class k. You really don't know f. I mean, you, you know it's in this class k. The best performance would be the error of the space y on how well it can recover a general function in k. And although, you know, you could think of alternatives, we always take the worst error. We're very pessimistic, we feel. You know, whatever algorithm we, we give, somebody's going to come along and get, pick the, the worst f and, and ask us how well do we do there. You could try some other measures like the average or error or something else. <clears throat> okay, so if this is the problem, you're given k, you're given the metric you're going to measure error in, and we fix n, which is the number of uh, parameters or the dimension. And now you can say, okay, what would be the best space yn that I could pick to build my algorithm? It doesn't mean that once I pick yn, it's trivial to build the algorithm, but what would be the best uh, yn to build the algorithm? Well, it's given by the Kolmogorov width. Did you define it in your talk? Maybe. I... So what it is, is you, you look at all the spaces of dimension n and pick the one which would give you the smallest error on the class K. Well, you can, you know, pictorially see that you have this K. Okay, so this is your set K, and then you're looking to cut through K with a linear space of dimension N, and it's fixed in such a way that the distance from the furthest point in k to y is as small as you can make it. So you wouldn't cut it this way, right? Well, maybe. I won't pick on anybody. I'm looking around, you know, what are you picking on? But then they all come up to me afterwards and say, well, why did you say, you know, about me? I'm not so stupid. Okay? But you would pick the best space to approximate k, and this would give you the error. So the best you could do would be to build your algorithm on this best Kolmogorov space. Now this is like quite problematic because it's not so easy to decide, given k, what the best Kolmogorov space is, number one. Number two, even if I gave you the best space, could you build a numerical algorithm? And suppose I even gave you complete information about f. I said to you, oh, whatever you want to know about f, I'll tell you. How would you still, you know, you want the mapping that takes f into its best approximation from y. <clears throat> but this isn't a linear mapping, and this isn't a simple mapping. This can be very complicated. Frequently, we project onto y. But projections have norms, and the, the norm may actually grow with n, and this wouldn't be an optimal solution necessarily. So, okay, I'm shoving a little bit under the rug by saying this is the best choice, but at least from a conceptual point of view, this would be the best y to begin with and try to build your algorithm using this y. <clears throat> okay. What? What is good about this little bit of theory is that it tells you something. It gives you a bound, a, a benchmark, or a lower bound. It says, look, uh, if, if this is your set k, and if you can compute dn width of k, and frequently we can compute dn of k without computing the best Kolmogorov space. There are ways of figuring out what dn of k is without actually computing the best space. Right, And if you compute dn of k, and then you then come up with an algorithm that performs the same as dn of k, then you're done. You, you have the best linear, well, usually it'll, there'll be a constant in there, and we're nice guys. We don't care about a constant like what, two or three in our business. This is not uh, so significant. So if you came up with something that performed like three times dn of k, we would be happy and say we have the best algorithm and we're done. We have a lot of theorems of this type that we've developed over the years that actually uh, tell you that you have the, the best 
algorithm in this sense. Okay, I mentioned to you that uh, actually uh, we discovered in the 70s that there's an advantage to what we, we call nonlinear approximation. And so I, I didn't like the, the previous uh, definition of optimality, which tied my hands to linear methods. I would like to allow nonlinear methods. Right? It's, uh, we know nonlinear can be better, so I'll, uh, I want to allow that. Now, in case you don't know anything about linear or nonlinear, you're beginning to get a little bit confused. What? I, I, mean, I don't quite understand what he's talking about. I'll give you a simple example where you can distinguish between linear and nonlinear uh, algorithms. So I'm going to give you two uh, spaces of uh, piecewise constant with n pieces. So a piecewise, um, so my, my, I'm going to talk about approximating a function on an interval, 0, 1. Okay, my function f is going to be defined on the interval 0, 1. And I want to distinguish between what is a linear and what is a nonlinear method. So in both cases, I'm going to say, well, I, I allow you to approximate but by piecewise constants, and the number of pieces is n. That's fixed, because it would be unfair to allow Bobby to use n equal 1 million and me only to use n equal 10, right? I may still be able to beat him with my n, <laughs> but he had an unfair advantage, right? So we keep n fixed. <clears throat> That's uh, how many pieces. And there are two, two what would linear be? Uh, linear space of dimension n with piecewise constant would fix the partition uh, where the pieces are in advance. And, you know, logically, if you, typically, why would you do anything other than divide the interval 0 and 1 into n equal pieces, unless you had some great information that F was really over here a lot was happening and here nothing was happening, you would generally divide it equally into n equal pieces. So a typical linear space would be to take uh, the interval 0, 1, divide it into n equal intervals, and on each interval you have a constant, right? That's a linear space, right? Spanned by the characteristic functions of these equal intervals. What would nonlinear do? Nonlinear would say, well, you still have to keep n fixed, but I'll allow you to put a partition down that depends on your target function f. Okay? So different f can have a different partition. So I allow in the competition the space I'm looking at, which we generally call, yeah, here it is, sigma n, is the space of all piecewise constants on some partition into n pieces. So this is a big space. And, and we can think of it as a manifold. But here, uh, if you add, one, one thing to note here, in this case, if you added two functions together, you would stay in the space yn. But here, if you add two functions together, you jump out of one, uh, sigma n, because you have n pieces, and the other function has n pieces, but they're different pieces, so when you add, you could get two n pieces. All right, so that's a complication, but it's not a linear. This, this space is not linear. <clears throat> but we know that it has some benefit to looking at uh, approximation with this nonlinear uh, spaces. And I just mentioned one example of uh, a, a theorem just to give you some feeling of why is nonlinear better. Let's look at two, po so we're on zero, one, and I want to look at two compact sets. The first one just lip one. These are functions that satisfy this inequality. First derivative is bounded, okay, by 1. First derivative is bounded by 1. If I go to approximate functions, if this were my model class, and I have to decide, do I use linear, do I use nonlinear, and I do some work, and I find that both of them give the same error, 1 over n. 
In fact, the linear gives one over n, and the nonlinear would sort of mimic the linear to say, well, I'll always pick the same partition. And so you might say, oh, well, you, your nonlinear is useless. Look, my example doesn't do well. <clears throat> but that's because if you're set k, if I change the model class, and if I take instead of k lip 1, take k bv, bounded variation, which you can think of as uh, functions whose integral is less than or equal to 1, derivative. It's not quite the same, but almost the same. So if you, if you take functions whose derivative is less than or equal to 1, the first one was, lip 1 was the L infinity norm was less than or equal to 1. Derivative never exceeded the value of 1. Here you just say on average, the derivative is like 1, right? And they have places where the derivative is big, places where the derivative is small, etc. Then you can actually approximate these functions, which is a much bigger class A, to accuracy 1 over n by nonlinear methods. But if I restrict you to use linear methods, you won't get anything. Well, how are you going to do? Whatever you decide to partition, I'll work inside of that, uh, I'll look at your partition, and on one of the intervals of partition, I'll put all the movement of f, and you'll never see it, right? How, how would I get 1 over n here? In this case, I would simply take the interval 0, 1, and I would divide it into subintervals where the integral of f prime on each of these subintervals is less than 1 over n. I would balance these. Then on each of these subintervals, I would take then the endpoints of these n subintervals to be the partition, and it would do a good job. It would do this job 1 over n. Because f isn't changing much on these intervals. Okay, so this is to, to warm you up to nonlinear versus linear, and nonlinear is better. So I'd like in my definition of what I mean by optimal to allow nonlinearity. While there are a lot of sort of ideas about nonlinearity, Albert mentioned already library widths, but there are other you know, there's n-term approximation, and there's uh, various uh, ideas about nonlinear uh, approximation. How do I put them all into one roof and say this is, this is what I mean by nonlinear approximation? And what I advocate, and you may uh, want to try to disagree with me, is that uh, I look at a method of nonlinear approximation in the following way. I, I want to approximate f, rather than requiring that <clears throat> yn is a linear space, I allow it to be a nonlinear manifold. What does it mean, nonlinear manifold? It means that every element in this sigma n, I call it, is determined by n parameters, okay, n numbers. For example, in the case of piecewise constants, it would be the n breakpoints and the n constant values, you'd get 2n. It would be a nonlinear manifold of dimension 2n. So I have this, uh, this is the, the, the space I would allow to, to use in my approximation, the yn. And I view that the approximation is gotten in the following way. I mean, I'm given f and I'm going to find the parameters I should use to when approximating f. That mapping I call A. Looks at F and says, okay, what parameters should I choose? Look at F, what breakpoint should I choose? What constant should I choose? That's a mapping A. The second mapping, M, is usually completely determined. It's how given those parameters, what would be the approximation. If I gave you the two n numbers, and I said the first n numbers were the breakpoints, and the next n numbers were the constants, you could write down the, the piecewise constant function, right? So I have two mappings, or two, two, two uh, mappings. A, which maps 
generally we only need A to be defined on K. Should have put K here, a little benefit there. So into Rn picks the n parameters, and then M takes Rn into X. And then once you have these two mappings, the approximation to F is first find the parameters, A of F, then apply M. This is your approximation to F. Okay, everybody clear? So I, I'm looking at nonlinear methods that can be put into that form. Can you argue that you have some good nonlinear methods that can't be put in that form? Well, let's talk about it later. I, I sort of view <clears throat> they can all be put into this form. Okay, so now I, I have some idea what I mean by a nonlinear method. All right, and now I want to define what, what's the best nonlinear method. So let's suppose I just say, okay, that's it. You have n is fixed and you can put down a map A, and you can put down a map M, A has to map an RN, M map that. What's the best you can do? I can tell you that you better think a minute. This is a problem. Why? Because I can take N equal 1, and I can define a manifold, which is a curve, that fits all of the set K with one parameter. So space filling curves, right? For example, to show you can get arbitrarily close, take your set K, take a bunch of points in K that are, every, every point in K is within epsilon of one of these points you've chosen, and I'll just take piecewise linear map that goes through every one of those points. Yeah, so I can get error epsilon. Well, I can get error as close as small as I want. So the, 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 if I use that as a definition, the error would be zero for every k. And you would say, "Whoa, isn't it great? The world is great. I can want well, one parameter. I can do approximation for everything." This, by the way, is a little bit of what's going on in learning. We'll see. <laughs> you know. Okay. So. We have to put some properties on A and M to avoid that. So that's the question. What should be the properties on A and M? One possibility is just to require A and M to be continuous. If you require that, that limits and avoids this uh, space filling. What happens in this, what, why uh, the, the continuity gets a worse and worse the more points you put in if you try to do a space filling. Okay, so that's one possible restriction. In fact, uh, this was showing that if you put this restriction down, uh, we, we did this when I was here at South Carolina with Ralph Howard and Charlie Michelli. We defined a, a width similar to Kolmogorov width where you assume that A and M are continuous. And we proved some properties about this width. And then we had a follow-up paper with George. George, this is, you remember that paper. Showing that for Bessoff classes that we computed the width. And, and that, uh, we called that a manifold width. So you want to put some restrictions on A and M. So continuity, okay. But is continuity good? Is it the right definition? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I'm going to say, okay, so I went at this and I thought, well, what the heck should be, you know, if I, if I really want to convince the numerical analysis community, this is what algorithms are, what conditions should I put on A and M? And my first thought, and Albert, I must say, never completely agreed with me, but my first thought was to, to, to require that A and M are lip one. Lipschitz maps. Why? Well, in numerical analysis, if you talk about stability, for example, for nonlinear and uh, for uh, uh, solving a uh, system of equations or something, this corresponds the the idea of stability and the uh, what is this constant called? Norm of m, norm of m inverse. Oh, the condition. condition. The condition number is really a Lipschitz stability. So I thought, okay, let's require that A 
and M are Lipschitz. What does that mean? That means if I have this mapping A that takes F into the real numbers, Rn, into Rn, and if I change F a little bit, the numbers in Rn don't change too much. I mean, if I change a little bit here and these numbers are going, I mean, the, the points in Rn are changing a lot, I think this is a lack of stability. So I said, okay, let's put Lip1, Lip, Lipschitz. And in the second direction, the M, I also require Lipschitz. That is, if you change the parameters a little bit, the resulting thing should be a little bit. Okay, so let's take this as the first definition. I'll criticize this a little bit in a, in a moment. But if I take this as the first definition, then I could define a width very similar to Kolmogorov width, where I could say, okay, you're allowed in your numerical algorithm to construct any A and any M. You're bounded by the fact it ha they have to A has to map into Rn and M maps Rn, so N is fixed. Okay? And then, given F, this is how you approximate F, and then you're allowed to look at all a and M that are Lipschitz. And they have a Lipschitz constant, I'll say gamma. Gamma is this amplification. If you change F by an amount, delta, the image changes by amount, gamma times delta at most. That's its factor gamma. So let's say I take this as a definition. Now all of a sudden I can talk about optimality. I can say, okay, these are the admissible algorithms. <clears throat> and how well can we do? And so now I'm going to mention some uh, theorems uh, that appear in a paper still being written with Albert, Nergana, and Chemek. And there are two parts to this theorem. So it, this theorem is about these widths and tells you some information about these widths, these new widths, requiring A and M to be Lipschitz. The first is that I can, if I'm in a Hilbert space, okay, when I go to Bonnach space, things are going to get cloudier, but if I'm in a Hilbert space, I can always build mappings A and M, given the class K, I can build mappings A and M so that the performance on K is the same as the entropy numbers on K. Well, maybe, yeah, there's a little C here. Maybe this is like 1 over 6. This is like 16 or something, 32. Okay. Modulo that little difference. The entropy numbers, somehow, whatever the entropy numbers are, I can do this. Now, I'll just say in a few words how you build this map, I mean, how you build A and M. It's not at all practical. You would take uh, K, you would cover it, and you would take a, a net of points, 2 to the N, points that give you the entropy of K. There would be a point cloud that represents K up to the accuracy epsilon N. Now you have the problem to have two to the N things. you got to get down to N. How do you get down to N? You use Johnson, Linden, Strauss, project onto an N-dimensional space, keeping the distances the same, roughly, right? And then once you have... <coughs> the points in that image, you find a way to map back into the space, for, uh, back into your space X, the Hilbert space. The way you do that is extension, what are called Lipschitz extensions of mappings. And you're in the great world of Hilbert space, and in the Hilbert space, given a, a set K, let's say given a set compact set K, and I have a Lipschitz map on K, and I want to extend it to all the Hilbert space, how can I do that? Who knows? What's the famous theorem that allows you to extend a Lipschitz map from any compact to the whole space? You know it? It's called Kurtzbaum. Kurtzbaum extension theorem. Powerful theorem that, you know, uh, Lipschitz extensions is a, have a long history in analysis, not just in this context. I mean, you have Calderon, Stein, Pfefferman, all this theory over decades. Whitney's extension theorem, right? But 
they all have their limitations. They only apply in certain certain settings. The Kirchbaum applies in the case of a Hilbert space. It's completely general and is very powerful. <clears throat> okay, so that's how you can prove this. And the wonderful thing is we can also prove a Carroll type inequality. So this is the second part of our work. That is to say that if any method performs like a, a delta, some delta k, and it goes to zero like k to the minus r or n to the minus r, then the, et, et, the entropy numbers must also go to zero like n to the minus r. This means that for all intents and purposes, the best error you're going to get in your numerical algorithm, which is here, is the same as this. Well, why I feel good that? Because if you give me a set K, certainly for any classical set K, Bessoff ball or anything, I can compute the entropy. I can compute the entropy numbers. If you have some crazy new definition of compact set, I, I would guess I can work and compute the entropy numbers. So entropy numbers are a lot more accessible than, than this thing, which is an info where all maps A and M, and I have no idea. Okay. So I think this is nice. This is a very strong uh, result. I like it a lot. If I go to extend this to, uh, oh, by the way, entropy numbers, in case you didn't know, I now tell you what the entropy numbers are. The entropy number says, okay, if this is your K, the, got, the game is to cover K with balls, and balls of radius epsilon. So these are balls of radius epsilon. You want to cover K. And the question is, how many balls do you need to cover? That, that is called the covering number. The smallest number of balls of radius epsilon that will cover K. And the log of that is called the uh, entropy. Now, if you want to say, what is the entropy number epsilon n? You can think of it this way. I give you a budget of 2 to the n balls. You can only use 2 to the 100 balls. You're, and why 2 to the n is like bit encoding, right? I mean, if you have n bits, you have 2 to the n possible strings, right? So I give you the budget that you can use 2 to the n balls, and I say, what's the smallest epsilon you can get? That's the entropy number, epsilon n. OK, in case you didn't know it. You probably all knew it. All right. Uh, five more minutes, maybe, if you're getting tired and saying, this guy is, how long do I have to withstand this pit pain <laughs> and agony? Almost right. So this can extend to uh, Bonnach spaces, but we're not happy with the theory, because when we go to Bonnach spaces, there are factors n that appear. Now, should there be factors then that appear? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, if you think like other problems, like uh, you want to project onto an n-dimensional space. In a Hilbert space, you can always find a projection onto n-dimensional space with norm 1. But if you go to project in a Bonnach space onto an n-dimensional space, then uh, you can't always project with norm 1. The best result is that you can project with norm square root of n, as Cottage Snowbar theorem. And so generally speaking in this world, once you move from Hilbert to Bonnach, you lose something in factors n, because the geometry of the space changes, right? I mean, you have the unit ball in L infinity or L1, which are polygonal um, boundaries, and the unit ball in, in Hilbert space is nice and smooth, so you lose when you go to uh, the general Bonnach space, but we're still not happy with the statement and the factors that occur in that, so I'm not going to formulate that theorem for you, but I just mentioned that there is a, a corresponding theorem if you want to approximate in a general space. Okay. Uh, I want to say something now. I have two or three slides on deep learning and neural networks, because this is a very... Uh, active and, uh, can I say, overhyped 
area of uh, <coughs> mathematics now where a lot of claims are made and everybody's, you know, pounding their chest and wow, neural nets can do great in deep learning and Google, you're going to, you know, get in your car and Google's going to take you to somewhere without an accident. Good luck. But <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so I want to say something about it. And, and uh, in deep learning, actually, the most common used uh, neural network are so-called ReLU networks. So in, in, in uh, neural networks, you have something called an activation function, generally denoted by sigma, and you can choose your sigma. And I'll explain that in a minute. And in the case of ReLU net, sigma is simply the function that's uh, 0 and then x. So it's 0 to the left of 0 and x to the right of 0. So that's how ReLU would be applied to a real number. And when you apply it to a vector, you apply it component-wise. And now what is the ReLU network? Uh, so I have a schematic here for a uh, ReLU neural network uh, with width 3. So in a neural network, there are a lot of different architectures that people look at. I want to look at an architecture where the width is fixed and the number of layers, which is called the depth, is variable, L. You can march along, pick L as large as you want. So in this picture, I've picked W, the width, as 3, and L is, can be anything you want. This is, by picking L big, is deep, deep learning. Okay, these are deep networks. And <clears throat> let me tell you what function you would get out if you input a number x. After you push it through this network, you get out a function. This is like our space yn. When we think of yn, we're creating functions on a manifold, and we're using them to approximate. So the outputs of this network are the functions that we'll use to approximate. So I want to tell you what it does. <clears throat> so what, what would it do? It, it's always going to uh, output a continuous piecewise linear function. And here's how it gets it. It inputs the number x. This is like your variable. And you're going to see what do you output? You output f hat of x. And the question is, what is f hat? What is that function? So at the first layer, what it does is it allows you to, and this is true at, at every successive layer, what you're allowed to do is take the input to that layer, x, you can multiply it by a constant, add an offset, and then take the, the value of that or the sigma of that. In general, if you wanted to look at neural nets that weren't value, you would have a function sigma of this. Okay, and it's called the activation function. So, and then uh, if, you, if you stopped at this layer, then, <clears throat> so at, at every one of these nodes, you have one of these functions, ax plus b plus. And if you said, oh, I'm stopping now and outputting, you would take a linear combination of these functions that you have at these layers, and you would get a piecewise linear function with three pieces, in this case, because I took w as three, but if I take w bigger, I get a piecewise linear function with a w piece. But I continue on. I don't do that. I continue on. And so at the next, uh, every successive layer, what I can do is take whatever the outputs were at the previous layer, I can multiply them by constants, add an offset, apply my ReLU to it, and, and then if I, uh, and, and I take this linear combination. So I get piecewise linear functions at every node, and they get more and more complicated because I, I have composition in, involved in this. When I'm done, I still get a piecewise linear function with n parameters, okay, de dependent on the n parameters of the neural network. So now the parameters are these a's and the b's, right, that you, you have used in the neural network. So I let this uh, class be denoted by upsilon n, 
all the outputs of the neural network. And the question is, people are saying, well, neural networks are great. So maybe this class upsilon n, instead of using polynomials or splines or trigonometric uh, polynomials or wavelets, maybe you should use the outputs of these neural networks, these functions, upsilon n. Okay, that's sort of the message you're hearing people talk about. And claiming, well, they have some magical power and approximation that you never thought about. And maybe they do, but I want to examine this a little bit. So what can we say about approximation using these guys? Where where now the L L is like n. The number of the depth is like n because the number of parameters is like w squared times n. So you can think of L as like n. So the number of A's and B's that you can choose is like n. All right? And I look at the outputs of the neural network, and this, this is the space of outputs, and it's a nonlinear manifold. Okay, that's the first thing to, to understand. It is a nonlinear manifold. And I can look at how well I can approximate with this. That's given here. And I can try to compare it with, well, you know, we can do that piecewise linear approximation with n pieces. That's simpler, and we understand this pretty well. In fact, Pencil is uh, one of the contrib great contributors to this. He proved some Jackson and Bernstein estimate for an uh, approximation by splines with free knots. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is, okay, here's good news for neural nets. They do as well as sigma n, because Whatever accuracy you can get with sigma n, I can get with a deep network. You may think this is kind of trivial, but no, it takes some work, because I fixed the width. If I allowed the width to grow, I could do it easily. Because the output of one layer of a neural network, if I allow the width to be n, is like sigma n. But here I fixed the width. But anyway, okay, you have this comparison. So this says that they do at least as well as piecewise linear, but do they do a lot better? And there are a lot of theorems trying to say, yes, they're doing a lot better. And I just want to make a little criticism of, of these theorems. So there's, uh, the first was a uh, theorem, so I want to talk about here, let's approximate lip one functions. And there's a result of Zhuawei Shen, who many of you know, and some of his collaborators who because of time I didn't look up their names, I apologize, I hope none of them are in the audience. <clears throat> and he essentially proves this, well there's a little glitch, but let's accept c n to the minus 2 for lip 1 with n parameters. Now, <clears throat> if uh, you're Lipschitz or Bernstein or something, you're turning over in your grave when you see this result. Because how the hell are you getting with n parameters accuracy n to the minus 2, when everything we know about is accuracy n to the minus 1, right? So, you know, you could either look one of two ways at this here and say, yes, really, these, numer these neural nets, deep neural nets are fantastic things. Or you can say, wait a minute, something, something fishy here I don't, I don't like. I'm in the something fishy business, okay? I don't... All right, so what is, what's going on? Well, remember, we can think of these uh, outputs of the neural net by these two mappings, A and M. What is A? It's how you would choose the parameters in your network. In fact, this is the business of Google, right? Google gets their data, and they say, oh, I'm going to look over all neural networks, and I'm going to find the right parameters to fit this function that I'm, I'm trying to learn from the data. And of course, they have supercomputers, lots of time, lots of time, and they go work like hell, and they get a, a fit. But still, their algorithm for getting the fit, what is their algorithm for getting the fit when they're choosing the parameters? They're using gradient descent or stochastic gradient de descent or some stochastic gradient descent with penalties. They have some 
particular algorithm, and you need to know, okay, how did you get this? What algorithm did you use? But in any case, whatever algorithm they use to find the parameters, that's the mapping A in our business, right? And the mapping M is trivial. I mean, once you have the parameters, how you construct, uh, you just plug those parameters into the network, follow it through, and you'll get the output. So from what we know and what I told you about, their mappings A and M can't be continuous. What we prove with, uh, in fact, with George, I guess, because we have uh, computed the N width with that uh, continuous A and M of lip one and shown that it's one over N. So you can't do it with continuous maps. So their maps can't be continuous. Or let's say the proof of the Huawei Shen is not such that the parameters he chooses to approximate F is continuous. The M part will be continuous, but the parameters choosing a cannot be continuous, so be careful there. Absolutely cannot be continuous. So here's the way I think of it. So remember we had this uh, space filling manifolds. We had, we knew this, we had to be careful because we could take a one dimensional manifold and fill space and approximate everything in K to arbitrary accuracy. And you could say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Let's build our numerical algorithm on the basis of your nice manifold. What's the problem? The problem is you're not going to find a parameter. Given F, you're, you're know, looking at this curve going crazy. You never find the T, the one-dimensional number T, where you land on this curve to approximate F. And I like to give the following analog, but you have to be over 70 to understand this analog. <laughs> so in the old days, <clears throat> we had radios. Uh, do they still have I, Yeah, in the car they have radios. But, and we had radios, and we didn't have digital tuning. So the, the stations weren't digitally tuned. It was analog tuning. And you turned a dial, and you tried to tune the radio station, right? And you found that, you know, some, you, you like the station in Memphis, Tennessee, and you're trying to get it, and you're tuning it, and you can't get it because, you know, you just go past and back. And then they had something called veneer tuning, where you had two knobs. You turn the coarse knob, and then you turn the fine knob. So your coarse knob gets close, and then the fine knob, and you, you try to tune. But you have still trouble tuning. So this one-dimensional manifold is like that. You have your target F. When you have this wild oscillation, you start moving T around, I mean, you're just jumping all over the place. And in fact, you're jumping a lot in space. You move T a little bit, but you're jumping huge amounts in space, so you're far away from your, right? Yeah. So that's the problem. And that's what the problem is with neural nets. If you, now, <clears throat> so if I require that the A mapping is bounded for neural nets, I claim you'll only get 1 over n. That the only way they're getting 1 over n is they're shooting over here, over there, you know, which sounds good, but I would say it's very much like uh, space filling manifolds, and, I, and I'm very uh, pessimistic of this. Okay, that is the end of my talk, and I congratulate the birthday boys, and thank you for listening. So you are you are making our life very hard in the neural network business, right? Because it means that all this expressive power analysis has to be combined with the way how you actually train. Yeah. The mapping thing, yeah. And I think they see some of this, you know, you have two divergent communities. You have approximation trained people proving expressivity theorems, like me and Zuawi and other people. And then you have the practitioners of neural nets that have a lot of tweaks. And I think there's an interesting idea there with this adversarial, 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 adversarial training. Yeah. 
because in the mini auto minimization of these fit terms, which are typically coming from these squares, they have an inner maximization of uh, of looking around your 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 current observation, which is which is what you fit, and you try you have to try to to train the, the parameters so that they don't allow a shoot up in this inner maximization. So you're saying how they try to defeat adversarial yes. attacks. Exactly. Because uh, this is what they, so exactly. those that, you know, this is a soft talk, okay, so you don't have to. But in uh, deep learning, you know, one of their claims is they're very good at classification. You give it a bunch of images of dogs and cats, and they train on this collection of images, and they're very good at classifying new images, whether there's a dog or cat in the image. <clears throat> and they caught fire because when they enter a competition with other methods, they perform a lot better than other methods. So, and then uh, somebody came along and they, uh, okay, so this, everybody got excited for a while. And somebody came along and uh, they showed an image which has a cat in it. Right, got correct, correctly classified. In fact, one of the training images, and then they simply change it a little bit the pixel values. Yeah, the, the, they change the pixel values, and you look at it, you see no change in the image at all. But then it's classified as a dog. <laughs> and they, well, what the hell happened here? Because, you know, and it's called an adversarial attack. If somebody can come along. Do something in your training. Well, this is a problem if you're using learning for medical reasons. Let's say I'm treating cancer and, and I, I, I've developed a learning technique and I say you have cancer and you go in and they cut you open and they guys say, Why don't you learn the cancer, you know? And then he sues you and then they say, Well, how did you, you know, predict the SK? Oh, we use neural deep learning. And they start pushing you what this deep learning, and then they find out, well, you know, if you just jiggle things a little bit, there's a lot of instability. That's my A's and M's. There's this instability. Right. So you have to do away with this instability. But I think they do it backwards. Namely, they say, oh, you came up with an uh, uh, adversarial attack. Okay, I'll take your adversarial attack and I'll correct for it. But, 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 but look, then, then I'll come along and I'll give another adversarial attack on your why, correction. This is I mean, why they try to take this. <coughs> it's, like taking a, it's like taking a dual mode for, for. Well, you have to. I, I think we should work on yes. this. But I think you, you have to define very uh, ad, yes. accurately what is an adversarial yeah, attack. Yeah. I mean, this is just a. I mean, this is just what is an allowed attack by an adversary? and quantify this mathematically, what type of perturbations are going to be allowed exactly. later exactly. that you have to be immune to. And then we can say, can you actually build something that's not affected by adversarial attack, or are you necessarily going to be a victim of this no matter what you do? And questions like that. Oh, they, they, they need some mathematical power. Yeah. Okay. They need that's Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. If not, let's thank Ron again.